thank you, Pamela, very much for, uh, for this wonderful honor. And ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guest, I'm deeply honored and I have to say thrilled to be here to share with the graduating class of 2010, your parents, relatives, and friends this very special day. Congratulations for choosing CMC and more importantly, for graduating from CMC, one of the finest colleges in the country. As I reflect upon As I reflect upon my own graduation in 1967, I assure you that I never thought that someday I might return, stand before a graduating class, and give the commencement address. I'd been a good student, but certainly not a perfect student. I achieved reasonably good grades, but the library did not monopolize my free time. I played competitive golf on the college team where I captained the team my junior and senior year and I was often at the beach dancing or dancing to the music of the Beach Boys. I led what I call a balanced life and at times my professors and certainly my parents held a very definition of balanced. Get the picture? Well, today I return to CMC as someone whose deep attachment to the school has made me an assiduous visitor and a supporter. I value the school's liberal arts at curriculum and its small size, which allows for close interaction between students and teachers. I'm happy to see the CMC student body becoming more international and diverse, and I feel fortunate to be in a position to support many of the school's initiatives, such as the Kravis Leadership Center, the Kravis Leadership Prize, and the new education building that is being built right now. CMC will always be home for me. And in the words of Bob Dylan, part of a never-ending tour. I mention Bob Dylan not only because I love his music, but also because he symbolizes the counterculture and social effervescence which prevailed in the 60s when I was a college student. It was a decade of tumultuous social, political, economic, and cultural change. We were in the midst of the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis very nearly upended the fragile nuclear standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Vietnam War raged. China detonated its first atomic bomb and pursued a cultural revolution that sent many intellectuals and suspected dissidents to farms, labor camps, or even death. Many African countries fought wars of independence against colonial powers. The Arab-Israeli conflict escalated into the Six-Day War, which set boundaries that are disputed to this day. The success of the Soviet Sputnik program triggered America's quest for the moon, leading to Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969. Anti-war protests, civil rights movements, and race riots dominated our internal discourse. Feminism flourished, and the advent of oral contraceptives further advanced women's liberation. Motown, Beach Boys, Jefferson Airplane, The Beatles, and The Rolling Stones, all products of the 60s. Jasper Johns, Cy Twombly, Bob Rauschenberg, three boys from the South began to transform art in America. Great society put a general mood of experimentation to find public policy. Political violence also scarred the land as John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., and Robert Kennedy were lost to America. All this marked the turbulent decade of my youth. Now, rather than frighten me, the change invigorated me. I saw the opportunities the change afforded. I welcomed the open-mindedness the change did. I recognized the flexibility the change required. I understood that these rapid and disruptive changes could help me look at who I was and who I should become. For me, change gave birth to a personal challenge. Today's change, although very different, more rapid, more global, calls you to nothing less. Let me share with you, and especially the graduates, some thoughts to help you answer that call by drawing upon what I have learned from my parents over the years growing up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
and from my schools, from my career, and from my family. Lesson number one, believe in what you do. Whether you choose the arts, science, public service, business, sports, full-time parenting, anything, do it because you believe it and you believe in the intrinsic value of what you're doing. Do it because you're passionate about it. To this point, there are no more inspiring example than the young men and women, many not much older than you, fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq for our freedom. They clearly believe in what they're doing. Your choices should not be dictated by the hope of material gain or recognition. In the current economy, this is idealistic and impractical because most of you do need to earn a living, reimburse student loans, or help your families. But in this labor market, you might not find the ideal job immediately. But the important thing is to get started without losing sight of your longer-term goals. Your first job may not be the ideal job for you, but never know, you never know where it's going to lead you whom you may meet, or what opportunities it may afford. Whatever job you take, be the best at whatever you do. Take away from it useful experiences. Learn from your successes and failures. Belief and persistence are not the same thing as dogma and stubbornness. Accept that you might have been wrong and adapt, but do not lose sight of your principles and fundamental beliefs. There is no job too menial. My job, after my freshman year at CMC, was on Wall Street as a runner, as someone who delivered stock certificates as a messenger. But I knew that if I excelled at that job, I would move up the ladder the following summer, which I did. Later in life, when George Roberts, another CMC graduate and my first cousin, and I, along with Jerome Colbert, decided to form KKR, we believed that we could use debt financing and equity to acquire under companies and change and improve the way they were managed. We wanted to put them on strong financial footing, stabilize and grow employment, improve the operational efficiency, and hence, improve the value of the asset. We were pushing beyond the obvious and getting started was not simple, but we persisted because we believed in the objectives. The second lesson, learn constantly. Graduation is not a destination. It's a stepping stone in a lifelong learning process. This knowledge-based world will always present you with an unexpected stream of new challenges and circumstances. We cannot predict them. We cannot name them. The black swan appears and our habits are toppled. Be prepared for change and learn from it. Listen. Broaden your horizons. Try to learn another language. Explore other fields of knowledge. Others, ask questions. There are no stupid questions. Simple queries of uninhibited young children often elicit the most profound thoughts about things we either took for granted or we overlooked. It was Alexander Pope who said, and I quote, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. So dig deeply, question the underlying assumptions, consider different and contrarian perspectives, understand how conclusions were derived. A Google search does not suffice, nor does a superficial survey of a few friends. When I interview job candidates, I probe their interests beyond business to understand the depth of their intellectual curiosity. Grades will reveal candidates' proficiency in their subject matter, but a broad set of interest and a mind open to new ideas and knowledge is to set them apart from the pack. Someone who will think differently and be creative in their approach. Someone who will think out of the box. Someone who has enormous curiosity. For myself, some of the most stimulating projects at KKR are those that present me with new learning opportunities. For example, about two years ago, we partnered with the Envir Environmental Defense Fund to help KKR improve energy and environmental 
and our portfolio companies. It has been tremendously rewarding for me to deepen my knowledge of environmental issues and to focus on solutions to current challenges. In the nonprofit field, my involvement as vice chairman of Rockefeller University has exposed me to a fascinating and complex world of science and medical research, something totally different than what I do in my day job. I know that the more you learn, the more you learn. Learning is truly a lifelong experience and is enriched if you endeavor to depart from your comfort zone and constantly challenge conventional wisdom. That is my lesson number three, challenge conventional wisdom. If something's repeated often enough, it more often than not becomes the accepted truth, especially if the statement carries one or two decimals. But ask yourselves, would people be ordering iPads if Steve Jobs had subscribed to the view of the World Wide Web where everything was free and all systems were open? Learn to think for yourself. Check and double check sources and understand how data are compiled. Take unemployment, for, for example. Does it make a difference if a drop in unemployment rates is caused by job creation or if it reflects the shrinkage in the labor force caused by discouraged workers who have stopped looking for work? Of course it does. What about energy debate? The U.S. produces approximately 3% of the world's energy but consumes between 22 and 25 percent of the world's energy. Does it matter that indeed the U.S. does consume 22 to 25 percent of the world's energy, but produces 22 to 25 percent of the world GDP? I think that puts things in a different context, does it not? The world of blogs, viral marketing, and lax editing standards, learn to ask questions and to understand underlying assumptions, intentions, and conflicts of interest. Learn to dissect and interpret information. Know what you don't know, which leads me to a critical lesson. Lesson number four, arrogance kills. Many times, success and talent breed a superiority complex that quickly leads to best at best to complete and at worst to arrogance. There's a saying that goes, one who sits on one's laurels has them in the wrong place. <laughs> now, how many companies have disappeared because they became arrogant and they failed to remain open-minded and connected to their markets? Sears, let Walmart supplant them. Sony, the master of the Walkman, let Apple conquer the market of mobile devices. Earlier, our steel industry neglected to adjust to world competition, and no industry was more complacent than the auto industry who thought Detroit forever would rule the world. Well, you're at your most vulnerable when you begin to think you're invincible and accountable to no one. Success can distort people and companies alike we can lose sight of the fact that success ultimately depends upon how well we have cared and nurtured whatever has been to us. There are far too many examples of institutions, of companies and executives who have forgotten this rule, strayed from the interest of their shareholders, customers, and other stakeholders. Be alert to change that is meaningful and purposeful, not simply change for the sake of change, not gimmicks but real change. Be more attentive to bad news than to compliments. Beware of the not invented here syndrome. You're not the only one with is. Arrogance kills. But as you embrace change, know that there are some absolutes. One thing that will never change, there is no meaningful success without integrity. Which brings me to lesson number five, honesty loyalty, quality are absolutes. It's not possible to be dishonest with colleagues, partners, shareholders, customers, family, whomever, be honest with yourself. It is not possible to be dishonest with yourself and at the same time be genuine to your relationships or at work or with your friends. Remember that in order to have professional integrity, you have to begin with personal integrity. You cannot get away with the idea 
Our product has fewer defects than the competitors, or our service is not as bad as the others. Nor can you tell yourself, I cheat on my taxes less people. There is no room for relativism when you're striving for authenticity, honesty, and loyalty. These are absolutes, and trust me, they will make your life a lot more simple and carry their own rewards. Speaking of rewards, aside from family, giving back to society is probably one of life's great gratifications. Lesson number six, give some self to others. Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, it is one of the most beautiful compensations of this life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. Trust me, there is nothing more fulfilling or soothing than giving back to others, whether with time, ideas, moral support, financial assistance, teaching a disadvantaged read, helping an elderly person cross the street, making the arts and education available to a wider public, providing resources for a science, scientist to pursue a remedy for disease, mentoring troubled teenagers, cleaning a park. In short, just giving something of yourself will make your lives whole and richer. In the book, The Little Prince, the fox says, it is only with the heart one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Let me, let that be your guide. When you volunteer to help others, and I know that many of you already do, you're shaping your own sense of personal worth and your values with someone else. You're seeing rightly with your heart. Many such actions go unnoticed by a broad public, but they enhance the quality of our lives together. Let giving be its own reward, because believe me, it is an amazingly powerful one. Throughout your lives, you'll be given many opportunities to give back. You'll also be given the responsibility to shape society. Think about that. You're living in a world where the scope, breadth, and depth of change are both exciting and perplexing. Where medical science opens the door to longer life, but at the same time raises troubling ethics issues. Where globalization paves the way for higher living standards for billions of people and the freer movement of goods and services and ideas, but also causes job losses displacements, and resource stress. Where the promise of biology and nanotechnology brighten our future, but where pandemics and terrorism are now household words. Where the internet transforms private life into shared experiences, but invades private and provides an unwelcome platform for narcissism and self-indulgence. This dichotomy, so characteristic of our changing world can be very unsettling. And know that the future will most certainly outstrip our imaginations. Today I see before me a graduating class drawn from scores of countries and states, from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and beliefs. You find your own personal and shared approaches to our changing world. You will find that each one of you can and will and must make a difference in his or her own unique way. I'm convinced that you will do so. I also firmly trust that if you believe in what you do, learn constantly, combat arrogance, embrace change, and give back, always with integrity and loyalty, your world will be a much better place. There's some debate whether Mark Twain or Satchel Paige who said, always work like you don't need the money. Always fall in love like you've never been hurt. Always dance like nobody is watching. And always, always live like it's heaven on earth. Thank, good luck, and Godspeed.